good morning we welcome the participants in the audience as well as online to this symposium 2 of the 133rd anniversary uh, international medical congress of the slma one of the worries we had about the covid pandemic is whether we are neglecting other common infectious and communicable diseases and non communicable diseases increase in their morbidity and mortality hence this symposium will address some of the infectious diseases that could have been neglected during this period will i'll invite first dr panduka karuna nayaka senior lecturer in department of clinical medicine faculty of medicine university of colombo and a specialist physician with an interest in clinical infectious diseases He has published research on leptospirosis, visceral leishmaniasis, and brucellosis. He will speak to us on leptospirosis. Thank you, sir. Good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, my thanks to the Sri Lanka Medical Association for this opportunity, and also for having this symposium and including leptospirosis in that symposium. Uh, I bring greetings from uh, my colleagues uh, yeah, who are working in the field of leptospirosis from the Medical Research Institute, uh, T H Karapiti, and other. hospitals in uh, the southern province and ratnapur and and uh, that area especially uh, and many others as well uh, so the outline of my talk is i'm going to ask uh, ask three questions uh, i don't know whether the slides are going on now um, so the first the, the questions are how big is the problem of leptospirosis uh, why does it need attention now and what needs to be done slides are going Oh, yeah i'm playing yeah there you are that's fine yeah okay thank you so uh, the first question how big is the problem um, so i thought i'll start with some statistics this is this slide will show you statistics at the national level um, i'm going to talk to you about the average for the last 5 years but having said that it's the last 5 years is actually 2014 to 2018 because that's based on the annual health bulletins uh, we don't have the bulletin for 2019 yet so we got that 5 years in the last 5 years the average number of cases was around 8800 per year and that gives an incidence rate of about 40 per 100000 which is pretty high and i think if you take a specific infectious disease diagnosis i think probably only dengue has a higher one uh, around 75% of those cases are in the age range of 20 to 59 which are young people and the male female ratio is almost 5 to 1 and the number of annual deaths on average has been about 200 uh, with a case fatality rate or a cfr of 2.2% that's the national level figures if you look at teaching hospitals themselves um, at teaching hospital level we know from experience that it, it accounts for a large number of tra uh, transfers in uh, and there's a large demand as a result for icu beds and hemodialysis Uh, and the teaching hospital case fatality rate has been over about 28% in one teaching hospital that's Karapiti when we did a study last year and published it so that's a pretty high case fatality rate you can see from the teaching hospitals lot of expenses lot of technology required and very high deaths why does it need attention now uh, for this what i thought i'll do is uh, i'll go to the statistics for this period I, i've taken from 2004 to 2018 and you can see i have broken them into four chunks there's a 2004 to 2007 period that's four years then 2008 to 11 another four years 2012 to 17 that's six years and then 2018 as a stand alone year so there are four different chunks if you look at the these years in that way the first row is about the number of cases per year you can see in the first chunk it about 3000 per year and it suddenly shot up from 2008 to more than three times that number average 10000 per year it came down a bit in the next four years but it didn't reach the earlier low level it still remained more than double the earlier level and in 2018 there was another big jump again to 11000 cases per year if you look at the annual deaths uh, it's been around 150 per year that almost doubled in that uh, 2008 to 11 chunk almost 300 and then came down to about 200 thereafter but one nice thing about it is that well nice in a way uh, not entirely but in a way is that the case fatality rate has been coming down 
from 4.3 to 2.8 to 2.5 and now 1.8 percent i have to say that this is not that nice because it's still more than 10 times the cfr for dengue so it st still does kill more than other infections uh, percentage wise but it's becoming less now so there was a step up in the incidence in 2008 it almost tripled uh, the two worst years was 2008 itself with about 10,000 cases and 357 deaths and 2011 with about 13,000 cases so far the highest with 265 deaths and there may have been another step up in 2018 with about 11,000 cases but fortunately the case fatality rate is steadily falling nevertheless but because of the high number of cases in a given year the number of the, the absolute number of cases dying is still high um, so basically approximately 200 deaths per year and that's also mostly from the economically productive age group and mostly males who are breadwinners. So you can see that it's a very important condition to um, pay attention to and you can also see that in recent times things have been changing epidemiologically be becoming a bigger problem. Uh, <clears throat> so the timing of the cases has changed from seasonal to throughout the year especially from May to November. Uh, the affected areas were earlier rural, but now it's urban as well. Uh, now, the clue to exposure was earlier in the occupation, like farmers and so on, but now it's not occupation anymore. Any occupation can get it. The clue now is environmental exposure, like wading in waters during floods and so on. And the incriminated reservoir in the past was the rat, but now there are several incriminated reservoirs, such as the water buffalo, cat, cattle, rats, dogs, and so on. So leptospirosis is now an increasingly urban disease and careful questioning about the environmental events is what is necessary to find the exposure, no longer the occupation. But even then, even if you carefully ask them still, they might not remember it and tell that at the beginning when they first present to hospital. I, I have often found that they remember their exposure only when they come for the conversion serum sample report about two weeks later. So we can't depend on that history so much now because it can be such a trivial exposure. And the clinical picture has also been changing. So this is a rather crowded um, table. So uh, I'm going to compare then and now, the earlier picture and the picture now. But uh, what I mean by then is basically speaking what I was taught, what leptospirosis looked like when I was a student and a, a PG trainee. And that's, that picture has now really changed. So if you take the, uh, the typical case, early it was fe fever with severe myalgia, conjunctival hemorrhages, but now you find more and more fever and myalgia is more common. Uh, it's actually probably because we are getting a non ectoric crowd more and more to hospitals because they are getting complications now, except uh, unlike in the past. In the past, uh, where the severe case was uh, fever, jaundice, and renal failure, the so-called Wiles disease. But now, severe cases are not ectoric. We used to be taught when we were students and uh, trainees that uh, those who are jaundiced are the ones who get in trouble and die. Now we find that those who do get in trouble and die are not jaundiced. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind now. Uh, and they can have lots of non-renal complications, then that's the reason why they die. So if you look at organ-related complications, in the past it was acute kidney injury, meningitis and myocarditis, but now we have pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage, acute pancreatitis, community acquired sepsis, Basically, they come just like a septic case and die very quickly. You can't even find a localizing symptom or sign. And there are other uh, rare complications like nervous system and so on, but I have not put all those things into this table. Uh, treating the critically ill patient in the past required, of course, antibiotics, hemodialysis, inotropic support, and artificial ventilation. But now you need uh, more expensive stuff like uh, uh, the sled is a uh, form of humidizer which is not very expensive but uh, we need expensive things like therapeutic plasma exchange and uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation which is uh, very expensive per patient. So we need to spend more money on these patients when they become sick. And the epidemiological picture has also changed. Early it was rural and poor. Now it is even urban and even the rich can get affected. Earlier the occupation was the clue, now it's the environmental exposure. So you can see that the clinical picture has now completely changed. So we have to reteach ourselves what leptospirosis presents like uh, uh, compared to what we thought of it in the past. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, sorry about that, we had a bit of a technical glitch over here, but we are back online now. So when we stopped, I think we were on this slide and I was explaining to you the changing clinical picture. Uh, from that, let me go on to the changing picture of in microbiology. 
Um, there are some new, in fact, some new genome species that have been identified now, which are going to be published soon. And I think that's important because it might give a clue about the kind of reservoir, reservoir species which is holding it in the natural reservoir out in the, in the environment. And also, uh, uh, very soon, hopefully, we will have some data about antimicrobial sensitivity as well. So if you would allow me to summarize the recent trends, uh, I, may, I said that the incidence is increasing. Uh, but it still affects mainly men in the economically productive age groups, especially the poor. Uh, the epidemiological features appear to be expanding from seasonal to endemic, from rural to urban, as well as rural continuing, uh, continuously, and from occupation related rel exposure to environmental exposure. Uh, the clinical picture is also changing from the form, form of typical picture is now changing. There are atypical presentations, therefore we need to have a greater suspicion of the condition as clinicians to, to pick it up. Uh, there are new troublesome complications which are coming, and there's a, uh, there, there's a need to, to uh, manage uh, the management needs uh, incorporating uh, microbiological testing and confirmation because we can't diagnose clinically in the way that we used to diagnose. And we also need expensive and new medical technology uh, with, of course, evidence. We don't have evidence for all of them at the moment uh, that also requires research. You might also ask, uh, what are the, why are these changes taking place? Is it a uh, problem in the natural reservoir, or a new pathogen strain, or changing human environment relationships? It's difficult to say, and that also requires research in the future. So my last question is, what needs to be done about this? I think as clinicians, uh, we need to learn to suspect leptospirosis more widely, uh, be aware of its newer presentations and, and newer complications. Uh, we need to try to achieve early microbiological diagnosis in unusual presentations because clinical diagnosis, as, as in the past, doesn't work very well anymore. So in the first seven days, we can do, fortunately, we have the tests that are required for that. Uh, in the first seven days, in the lepto in leptospiremic phase, we can do PCR from blood or CSF uh, at the MRI, as well as we can take a serological sample for the acute sample for the ser serology. From the day eight onwards, you can depend on serology, doing the, the what's called the MAT at the MRI. And in high prevalence areas, uh, we should also do blood cultures so that it will help in, uh, in identifying the organisms and that will help in, in public health, in prevention, because that will tell us an idea about what the incriminated uh, reservoir species is. And also we can uh, test antibiotic sensitivity. Uh, and then we have to start antimicrobials with antileptospirosis cover. If you give intravenously, only three antibiotics are probably good. That is benzylpenicillin, keftraxone, and kefotaxin. Uh, but of course, for uh, less severely ill patients who are on outpatient care, we can try doxycycline and macrolides. And watch out for complications and detect them early, because the earlier the detection, the better the prognosis. And a liaison with a nephrologist and an intensivist is very important. Uh, public health specialists also have some questions to answer. They need to answer the question what the natural reservoir is. Uh, it, may, it may be different in different areas, uh, how to minimize occupational and environmental exposures, uh, how do we make an early diagnosis at the primary care level, keeping in mind that we now have the investigations required at the MRI, especially PCR, and also the question of whether we actually need doxycycline prophylaxis, that's another important question that we must try to answer. So my last slide is this take-home message. Uh, leptospirosis is becoming a bigger problem because it's increasing in incidence, but fortunately, the case fatality rate is coming down. It is also becoming a different problem with a changing epidemiology, changing clinical picture with unusual presentations and complications, and changing new managements, um, especially the need for microbiological confirmation and new treatment modalities and research on them. So we need to do more research on, especially on microbiological, therapeutic, epidemiological uh, aspects, and also using the One Health approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Karuna Nayaka. We'll take the questions at the end of the three presentations via Zoom. And uh, we are sorry about that five minute uh, delay with the technological problem. Next, we'll have Dr. Chandimani Undugodage, who is a consultant respiratory physician and senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine, uh, Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayadanapura. She'll talk to us on influenza.
Um, I'd like to start by thanking Sri Lanka Medical Association for inviting me to uh, give this talk, and thank you, sir, for that kind introduction. Um, so I will start with a, a case scenario. A 55-year-old female complained of fever and dry cough for three days. She was treated at the outpatient department, but five days later, she became short of breath and she was admitted into hospital. Now, uh, she had traveled from Australia a week before her symptoms began, and on admission to hospital, where well, she was hemodynamically stable, respiratory rate was 40 breaths per minute, saturation AR was 82%, where well, she was resuscitated with oxygen and so on. Chest X-ray showed bilateral alveolar shadows. Blood test CRPs were uh, in the range of 20 to 30. Blood cells, uh, bl blood count showed a viral picture. Uh, so to keep it short, I will just show you the um, HRCT. This was when I was brought in. Um, so you can see that there are uh, bilateral ground glass shadows and few uh, basal um, consolidations. You can see that there are no pleural effusions, no pneumothoraces or cysts in the lungs. So if we see this uh, picture now, what would we think? COVID-19 pneumonia. But actually this patient came to me a year ago. So we thought of influenza. So that's my talk is going to be influenza in the setting of COVID-19. Um, so influenza has been there for many, many, many years. So it infects about 10 to 20 percent of the world's population each year, leading to about three to five million hospitalizations. So we all know that it is generally it's an acute febrile illness and it is usually self-limited. Uh, and it commonly manifests uh, as fever, malaise, and cough. And people die because of pulmonary complications. And um, we know that it has epidemics. It tends to cause epidemics and also seasonal outbreaks. And it has the ability to cause pandemics. So just a little bit about the influenza virus. So it's a spher uh, spherical structure with a nuclear uh, capsid with eight segments of SSRNA and it is enveloped and it has two types of surface antigens and these are important because this is actually what we used to name these um, viruses. So you have hemagglutinins and neuraminidase. So depending on that there are different types. Um, so type A is the one that gives us a lot of grief. Uh, type B is also there but it doesn't cause so many problems. And in type A, there are subtypes, so depending on the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase um, antigen. So you have H1, N1, H2, N2, and uh, so on. So these subtypes, um, um, so if you go into virology, they talk about antigenic drift and antigenic shift. So when there is an antigenic shift, there is a major change in a subtype, which can give rise to pandemics. Um, so how we name these ones, so we are very familiar with H1N1 because that's what we have been dealing with. So it's the host of origin, um, the geographical origin, the strain number, and the year of isolation. Uh, so transmission, again, it is uh, uh, nothing new because we've been talking about this type of transmission uh, uh, at uh, present. Um, so there are droplet transmissions and airborne and through formite. So droplets, again, um, you have, uh, when, the, uh, when the particle size is more than 100, we say they are droplets. And when it is less than five micrometers, we talk about um, airborne transmission. So influenza is transmitted in all three ways. So we know COVID-19 is the same. So recently, there's a lot of talk about airborne transmission as well. Um, so incubation period is about one to two days. And viral shedding in uncomplicated uh, influenza is about three to six days. So this is how the uh, virus gets uh, attached to the uh, respiratory epithelium. So you can see that it mainly affects the um, airway and alveolar type 2 epithelial cells. With COVID-19, we talk about the ACE receptor. Um, so these cells express something called the silic acid residues, and these function as a receptor for the virus. So when the virus gets attached to this, then it, the virus gets internalized and then the um, RNA gets incorporated into the uh, nucleus and there is viral replication and viral release. For the release, the neuraminidase uh, is important. It is the hemagglutinin that actually attaches the virus to the um, cell. 
Um, so um, mainly, so they have uh, respiratory symptoms. So um, fever, myalgia, headache, runny nose, sore throat, cough, vomiting. And they can present with viral pneumonia like the patient that I described. And one of the biggest problem is the secondary bacterial infection that will follow because there's a lot of damage to the um, uh, respiratory epithelium, which can give rise to secondary bacterial infection. The common organisms that we need to cover at that point would be Staph aureus, Strep pneumonia, and Haemophilus influenza. As it gets worse, they can go into acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we all know that causes a very high mortality. So just to um, tell you um, the difference between COVID-19 and influenza, so they both have dry cough and fever, so it's very difficult to differentiate. And um, headaches and body aches are more with influenza compared to uh, COVID-19. There are a lot of non-pulmonary manifestations of influenza. Um, so one of them is myocarditis. This is again something that we commonly see. Uh, so 0.4 to 13 percent of hospitalized patients with influenza. And uh, interestingly, it often occurs in the absence of more severe respiratory complications. So we are not talking about patients with severe pneumonia developing myocarditis. They can come with myocarditis uh, per se. So this is um, diagnosed based on the symptoms, cardiac enzymes and echo findings. So patients present with chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, or arrhythmias. And um, generally, this is seen after about four to seven days with the onset of symptoms of the viral infection. So when they develop myocarditis, mortality is about 23%, so that is quite high. Now, interestingly, there is a temporal association between the circulation of influenza viruses and increase in hospitalizations and deaths due to MI. Um, so there is a lot of myocardial infarction seen uh, in, in during epidemics. So there, are, there is some belief that there is a connection between uh, ischemic heart disease and influenza because they, these, there are changes in the uh, vas vascular endothelium which is prone to thrombosis and so on. Then neurological complications, so influenza associated encephalitis, encephalopathy, acute necrotizing encephalopathy. This is commonly seen in children less than five years of age and Guillain-Barre syndrome. So these are very less common ones. So narcolepsy, uh, because I have an interest in sleep medicine, so I brought that in. Apparently there is a connection between influenza and narcolepsy. There, there tends to be higher threefold increase in narcolepsy after 2019 H1N1 pandemic. Um, so rhabdomyolysis is another uh, uh, known complication, but these are just case reports and there, are, there were no large studies on this. Um, so patients uh, can develop uh, acute kidney injury, secondary to rhabdomyolysis, sepsis, but there is very limited evidence to support direct viral invasion of the kidneys. So they can get uh, ocular manifestations like conjunctivitis, uh, thromboembolic disease, but this is not as much as described with COVID-19. Now we know that there is a lot of talk about thrombosis with um, COVID-19 and also hemophagocytic syndrome, which is described in both conditions. So just to show you um, about uh, influenza and COVID-19 and the R0 number. R0 number is how many people will be in infected by an average individual with the disease. So with um, influenza it is 1.3 and COVID-19 is 2 to 2.5, so that is much higher. So influenza has a very interesting history. Um, so um, there were at least four pandemics in the last 20th uh, se century. And if I were to summarize, so these are the uh, four pandemics. The most recent one, the one we all can remember is the 2009 one, which has uh, caused about uh, 280,000 deaths. At present, COVID-19 deaths is about 600,000. But the most interesting one is the Spanish flu, the H1N1 uh, pandemic. Um, so that is the most severe pandemic in the recent history because it has cost us about 50, it is estimated that we lost about 50 million lives in that uh, pandemic and 500 million people were 
infected with the virus. So this was at a time where there was no vaccine, something similar to what we are facing today, but there were no antibiotics either. So they would have died of a lot of secondary bacterial pneumonias. So it's very interesting. So they stir the same principles that we are following today was followed at that time. Social distancing, quarantine, personal hygiene, limitations on private gatherings. So I found some newspaper articles from uh, that time. So it was a deja vu. They had gone through exactly what we are going through down now. And uh, so people wore masks uh, to uh, go to work, to do their work. And I found this very interesting uh, cartoon uh, from the Daily Mirror where he has put, so uh, they were avoid, asked to avoid going in the subways, not in public transport, but to walk but don't get too tired and to stay away from people. So in the end, you have to live in this uh, uh, tower up there away from everybody to get uh, uh, to uh, uh, prevent yourself from getting the uh, flu. And this is a picture from San, San Francisco where they held a legal court in a park because of the epidemic. And interestingly, this is from a naval aircraft factory. So they have, the Navy had given them problems. So there had been a lot of positive cases in, uh, in the naval aircraft factory. So they said, do not spit. And the barbers. So I brought this up because recently the ministry developed a guideline for barber shops and beauty salons. So they too wore masks. And uh, this is a street cleaner from New York. So he's all um, covered up with a mask and cleaning the streets. So uh, there was an interesting uh, saying that I found, which was by the New York uh, Police Department, better be ridiculous than dead. So, uh, and then, which brings me to this image, and this man here seems to be thinking along the same lines. And this was taken here in Sri Lanka during a brief release of curfew during the lockdown period. Um, so the 2009 influenza pandemic, which is the one that we all remember, uh, it affected children, young and middle-aged adults, rather than the elderly, and 280,000 uh, population of the world's population died. So seasonal um, uh, influenza, most mortality is seen, there was a disproportionate mortality in the elderly. Pandemic influenza, a disproportionate mortality in the younger population. So this is uh, believed to be partial immunity conferred by exposure to historically circulating strains in the elderly. And in uh, 2009 H1N1 uh, pandemic, there was severe prolonged asthma and exacerbation of COPD was uh, seen, which we didn't see so much with this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, obesity was seen as an independent risk factor for the development of respiratory failure and mortality. And pregnancy is also a risk factor for poor outcome, especially in third trimester. And certain studies have shown that there is a genetic susceptibility for those who do worse. So how we diagnose, it is um, pretty much the same as uh, for COVID-19. Now we take nasopharyngeal aspirates, nasal and throat swabs in viral transport medium, and the bronchoalveolar lavage. So we do not do bronchoalveolar lavage for COVID-19. The other two we do. Um, so it is important that the samples should be collected during the first four days of the illness. And the diagnosis is by RT-PCR. And um, they, uh, the antigen detection by immunofluorescence is also a diagnostic method, but uh, the results can be obtained in less than 15 minutes, but they have very limited sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity. And the wide, third one is the virus isolation. Um, so how do we treat? Um, so the uh, initial it was amantadine and rimantadine which targeted the M2 ion channel, but now these drugs are universally resistant. So what we are using is the neuraminidases and what we have here is the oseltamivir. And um, so these are most effective in limiting viral replication in the early stage of the disease. And for those who present within 48 hours of symptom onset, and we tend to use them in high risk hospitalized patients, pregnancy less than two years, and elderly and those on immunosuppressives. And unfortunately, even for seltamivir, resistance is uh, rapidly uh, increasing. And um, it is believed that even in severe disease, um, if you, even if you ad administer the therapy late, do go and give it because it can improve the uh, clinical outcome. So generally, we give 75 milligrams uh, twice daily um, for five days, but parental therapy is recommended in those with severe disease. 
So prevention again back to the basics, hand washing, face mask, social dis uh, distancing, what we are practicing today and uh, prevention. So fortunately for influenza, there is a uh, vaccine. So each year the investigators at the WHO, they collaborate with USA and Europe to identify the prevalent viral strains and decide uh, on the vaccine. So this is an yearly vaccine. So there are two vaccines developed for the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. And um, uh, generally there are two uh, influenza, two strains, which includes H1N1 and one or two strains of influenza B. Um, so patients who are high risk are expected to get this yearly. Um, so what we are using here is the killed vaccine. The live vaccine is actually by a nasal spray, which we do not have here. And uh, prophylaxis again, oseltamivir. And recently they, there is some um, uh, data on something called baloxavir. I'm of course not very familiar with this, but it is a polymerase acidic uh, protein endonuclease inhibitor and uh, which has shown some efficacy in prevention. So what about the current landscape? So globally, influenza activity was reported at lower levels than expected for this time of the year. So perhaps because we are using such a lot of uh, preventive methods for COVID-19, that may be one reason. The other reason is people are more focused on COVID-19 than influenza. We tend to think COVID-19 for everything, so it could be underreported. So Southern Asia, Southeast Asia, no influenza cases have been reported. So this is from the WHO on the 6th of July update. Um, so COVID-19, um, again, when it comes to mortality, so you can see it's quite um, high. This is actually from deaths in England and Wales. So it's less with influenza and more with COVID-19. So influenza has killed far more than COVID-19 over the years. And uh, similar principles, hand hygiene, face mask, and social distancing will prevent influenza infection. And we do have specific treatment and a vaccine. Um, so although COVID-19 has clearly stolen the thunder, influenza has not taken its leave. So it is of paramount importance that we consider infection influenza when we are managing with patients with uh, upper respiratory symptoms and viral pneumonias. So finally, I leave you with this newspaper clipping from 1819. As you can see, pandemics may come and go, but we seem to have not changed at all. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Undukodagi. Next, uh, next we have Dr. Neranjan Disanayaka, who is a consultant pulmonologist, teaching hospital and district chest clinic in Ratnapura. He is a fellow of the Ceylon College of Physicians and Royal College of Physicians since 2019. He will talk to us on tuberculosis. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, just remove the mask. Okay. Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I would like to thank the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association for inviting me for this prestigious occasion of the 133rd uh, anniversary. Uh, Medical Congress. Uh, can we have the slides, please? Yes, and uh, actually, uh, COVID nineteen has uh, taken up by uh, taken us by s surprise, and uh, this tiny particle, which even cannot be considered as a being has made us uh, the enlightened ones, the homo sapiens, and uh, we have to make a bow in front of this uh, organism. And as Chandimani said, it is not the first time that it has happened in the history of our medical uh, history, 
when it is coming in again and again and we were actually neglecting the coronaviruses until very recently but it showed its true picture in 2002 with the SARS epidemic and then again in 2013 uh, with the MERS epidemic and now we are dealing with SARS-CoV-2 a similar virus to the previous uh, SARS virus and at the same time probably we might be able have to deal with a similar virus in about five or six years down the line. So what it has done is it has made a huge medical impact, it has made a huge social impact and at the same time it has made a huge economical impact in the way we live and how we manage things. Now let me introduce to you the Mycobacterium tuberculosis bacilli and uh, it is actually a complex of uh, five or six species. Now they are identifying even clades, uh, certain types of subspecies on it and this has lived with us since our Neolithic times. When we were using Stone Age equipment, tuberculosis has been shown to be affecting and uh, destroying human lives and causing morbidity and mortality. So it's, a new di it's not a new disease, it has been with us for a long time. Since Homo sapiens evolved in the Horn of Africa and rapidly spread throughout the world, you know, marking its presence as a species, tuberculosis came with us. It spread with us. And so much so that in the 18th, the 17th, 18th, 19th century, there were millions of people dying worldwide because of tuberculosis, causing a lot of a uh, significant amount of morbidity as well as mortality. And as you know, it has been named as the white plague simply because when you get tuberculosis you are malnourished, you get hemoptysis and you are pale like a ghost and sometimes it is said that the Dracula stories originated from the white plague pictures. So we have been struggling with tuberculosis for, for centuries, millennia, we have been struggling with uh, tuberculosis and now we have another issue, a new kid on the block. Now, when we look at the lower respiratory tract infections, the deaths that the mortality is causing, it's, one, it's known to be the third commonest causes of, cause of death worldwide. And it causes about 3 million to 3.5 million deaths worldwide. Out of which, interestingly, half of it is because of tuberculosis. And tuberculosis is the top infectious killer in the world at present. Even though during the 1950s after the paradigm change of the Western society because they have increased hygienic methods, improved economical ability, they were, they were able to manage tuberculosis and they were able to contain tuberculosis. But unfortunately in the world, the third world, the developing country, tuberculosis remains a huge challenge up to now and it is the most commonest cause of death throughout the world until very recently. The other aspect of tuberculosis is that when you get influenza or COVID-19, yes, you get it, either you get better and then you or you die or succumb to the disease. But the other aspect of mycobacterium tuberculosis is that it can stay in your body for a long time. You might get infected with tuberculosis when you are a child, but you might get tuberculosis, active tuberculosis when you're about 65 to 75 years. Age. So you are actually harboring this bacteria for a long time. So it is not simply a simple infection which might give you the disease or not, but it is a disease that will be there with you for a long time. The latent tuberculosis that we are dealing with, about one third of us are already infected, the whole, whole world population. But if we take a country like Sri Lanka or India, probably around 60% of, of us are infected. So we have latent tuberculosis in our bodies. And any, any insult, any immune compromise, any um, say malnutrition, HIV, uh, obesity, uh, sorry, uh, chronic renal failure, 
or anything or severe diabetes even, we might have a scourge of uh, tuberculosis appearing out of nowhere and he can spread the disease to another person. This is the challenge of tuberculosis. It's not a simple disease. It's a basically a medical sociological disease. Now, this new kid in the block, if you look at this slide, you can say that. Now, this is actually a beautiful slide. There is an animation of this slide in the internet. I think it will show how gradually COVID slowly catches up with the mortality figures of almost all everything. And out up to 17th of uh, July 2020, tuberculosis still has the edge. And I think it probably would have changed by now. So even then, we have lost about... 650,000 people up to now from tuberculosis in the world, while we have lost about 500 or 591,000 uh, uh, due to COVID. Now, this 591,000 has happened during the last probably six to seven months, but we have been losing around 650,000, that is twice the amount, that is 1.4 million people per year during the maybe the time immemorial. That means we have losing people, about one million people each year due to tuberculosis. So that is the important aspect that we have to think about. Right, why? Now with, with tuberculosis and COVID coming together, one important question that we might ask ourselves is that, does co-infection increase the risk of death? Does co-infection with tuberculosis and COVID infection increase the risk of death? And as uh, Chandimani and uh, Chandimani pointed out, usually when you have two diseases together, usually we increase the death toll. So do we have any, any data to support this? So I would like to go back to 1918, where this is a beautiful study, study in PLOS One, uh, where they have analyzed the, uh, the uh, death rates retrospectively in Sweden, uh, during the Spanish and the Russian swine flu, the Russian flu uh, epidemic. And we have, they have shown that pulmonary tuberculosis mortality, due to uh, when you have PTB and uh, influenza, the mortality is raised by a factor of 1.5. So you are more prone to die when you have active or latent tuberculosis than you don't have tuberculosis. And the Russian flu, it has shown the value of 3.6. It, it has not been statistically significant if you look at the p-value. But again, probably when you have tuberculosis with a viral infection like influenza, the mortality rate has shown to be increased. And they have done another study. This is actually from the uh, uh, computational and mathematic methods in medicine. They have actually had a mathematical model to analyze the deaths and the causes of deaths and the behavior uh, during the pandemic of tuberculosis patients. And they have noticed that substantial numbers of tuberculosis patients have died during the pandemic. And uh, they have been hypothesizing that because it is because the influenza the death rates, especially among young, can be attributed to TB. Now, I want to highlight a very important point that the authors say here. Now, when they have analyzed the death, especially during the Spanish flu, they have noticed that the majority of deaths were happening in young males who were active. And if you look at the demographic features during that time of tuberculosis, most of the pulmonary tuberculosis patients had been males and were in the economical active age group. And because of that, they think that mo some of these deaths that were attributed to influenza per se was due to actually with the because of the co-infection of influenza. So the mortality rate has increased. And at the same time, they, they, uh, they tell us an in interesting factor. Because of these deaths, now after they followed up these patients, they have noticed that after the influenza pa pandemic, the TB rates have dropped drastically within the next five years. So one reason that they think that because of the influenza, the people who were having smear positive tuberculosis died, who were the active people who were going to places and spreading the disease. And as a result, the next five years, they were probably, uh, the numbers of tuberculosis were low. 
even though it might think you know you might think it's a blessing but if you think at individual life i don't think it is a thing that we should appreciate so anyway so probably the spanish flu helped europe to reduce the number of tuberculosis and help them fight against tuberculosis in a way right so every dark cloud has a silver lining it seems but it's not a nice thing to say anyway now how about the covid-19 infection at present even though the, this consortium has a very good uh, you know analysis but their final conclusion as in most uh, international uh, organization is that there may be an interaction between covid and tb but long term observations are lacking if you read many any article Uh, in any journal or any any organization they don't want to take that responsibility they just you know be they are trying to be a bit safe and i think as responsible organizations they should do that but you know sometimes we need guidance as professionals as well as people so they have to be a little bit more precise uh, than this and this uh, actually has been the, the, the taken from a study of about 49 people who were Uh, co-infected with uh, covid as well as uh, tuberculosis out of which 42 has active tuberculosis and seven had past tuberculosis and out of which 42 were diagnosed tuberculosis before and seven were diagnosed as covid uh, as well as tb simultaneously and what have they noticed is that the mortality rate in this group of people is about 10.5 which is more than the mortality rate that is happening in a normal covid population so they think that the mortality rates increase even in covid and tuberculosis but still uh, there have been no conclusive evidence up to now now this is a pubmed article which is not yet peer reviewed a beautiful article involving 3 million people uh, with tuberculosis in south africa cape town south africa out of whom about 350 had tb and out of which 22000 had covid 19 adjusting for all co-founders they have found that tb increases the risk of covid 19 death by 170% and even prior tb increases the risk by 51% so this is actually not peer reviewed and published at the moment but this is the landscape that we are dealing with so tuberculosis per se active or past tuberculosis is a risk factor for death in covid 19 so this is the direct impact does it have any indirect impact in uh, death of patients with tuberculosis now they have studied that this is the who slide which showed that because of the impact on the surveillance case detection rates we are expecting about 5 million more for about sorry 500000 more deaths in 2020 then when you compare to the 2018 so we are expecting more that this is a mathematical modeling that they have done and there's a beautiful another mathematical model that has been done by the stop tb campaign which has shown that if we have 3 months of quarantine only 3 months and if we have 10 months of you know a lag period to restore the services for to the previous uh, settings we will lose even then we will lose and we will have additionally 6.3 million people that is about one third of one probably one third of our population and uh, we will have about 1.4 additional deaths that is almost you know the number that is dying in each year so that is why it is said that because of this uh, covid impact we have gone back 5 years back with regard to the tuberculosis control in the whole world these are not actually you know seen but unfortunately these are the uns- unseen uh, Uh, problems with uh, covid-19 delayed presentation might be the main cause because with the patient with cough they they will not usually come to the hospital the financial aspect will prevent them from finding uh, transport because the patient does, the public transport mechanisms are not working and the third thing is even when the patients you know come to the hospital they will be probably be stigmatized and because of that they will delay the presentations even when they have symptoms of tuberculosis diagnosis again these patients are not properly assessed by doctors sometimes because of the fear of covid cough and fever you go to some area but you are not properly assessed unfortunately and the second thing is when you analyze the sputum which is a high risk sample there are and there were problems of 
co doing the sputum AFB, simple sputum AFB, as well as gene expert. Even in our facility, we were doing bronchialveolar lavages sometimes, but even there, there was a delay because we, our facility was a COVID testing center and we had to give the priority for that. And so there was a delay in diagnosis as well in patients. Optimal care had been a problem throughout the, uh, the centuries and throughout the world in Sri Lanka as well because tuberculosis is a contagious disease and Madam will agree even TB meningitis patients in certain wards are kept separately from other people and they are neglected to a certain extent. They don't get ICU care as other people does and because of that and even with the COVID epidemic, these people were further neglected. And because of these multiple comorbidity patients coming with uh, COVID, uh, with tuberculosis, they were further neglected. And probably the death rates would have been high in these patients. And the preventive strategies, you know that we have a very good preventive strategy in Sri Lanka at the moment, and where we can do contact tracing. But if we ask a smear positive mother to bring her child to be contact screened, they will not bring the child because the, she's afraid to bring the child. And the mothers and fathers have told me that, that they are afraid to bring the child because of, uh, because, because of the COVID. Sometimes there had been a three or four month delay when the patient was being screened. And this delay in these children especially might be the cause of future TB risks in these children because of the delay in INH, start initiation of INH. And this is actually the Ratnapura criteria. I just wanted to analyze, in the final field study, I want to analyze how it has affected uh, in our local scenario. Ratnapura has a population of 1.2 million. It's about one eighth of the land area of uh, the Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka. So basically, if you look at this, you will see that this is only the chest clinic, which is the only organization you know, that is there in the Ratnapura district. So to analyze uh, to, for respiratory diseases, th this, I have not included patients from uh, the OPD on the hospital. You can see a drastic reduction of uh, OPD visits, especially starting from March, April, and May. So when they don't come, we can't diagnose them properly. And if you look at another slide, this is the second visit of OPD. Usually when we see them, first we ask them to come in the second visit with a sputum sample, x-ray, and other investigations. But unfortunately, you can see again in April there is a marked reduction of patients. Did this affect tuberculosis number? Yeah, this is up to July 116. If you double it, the six months is about 220, and it will not reach 384. So we probably missed about 60 patients. And if you look at the sputum positive ones, are the most affected in this group. And these patients will give the disease to our household. And each tuberculosis patient who is not treated can give the disease to another 15 patient, per people per year. So that is a significant scenario that is there. And look about the Extrapulmonary tuberculosis, these patients might have TB meningitis, TB lymphadenitis, T pleural effusion. They will suffer silently without coming into the hospital with complications. And number of tuberculosis patients who have been diagnosed, you can see only 11 has been diagnosed when we compare the 34 that we had been diagnosed in 2019. So it is not a s seasonal thing. It is simply because of tub uh, the COVID epidemic and the lockdown effects, uh, say. And if you look at the quarters, you can see from January to March, it's almost the same three years. But if you look at the second quarter, April, May, June, then you can see a drastic reduction of patients coming with tuberculosis and diagnosing with tuberculosis. I will stop with this quote from the uh, executive director from uh, the Stop TB par Partnership. Today, the government faces a tortuous path navigating between imminent disaster of COVID-19 and the long-running plague of TB. But choosing to ignore TB again would erase at least half a decade of hard-earned progress against the world's most deadliest infection and make millions more sick. I think that is the important thing that we as health professionals should understand. We should manage them in a parallel way rather than neglecting uh, a simple thing because one has more uh, dramatic entrances. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Disanayaka. Thank you, Dr. Disanayaka. Uh, the session is open for questions now. Uh, participants, yes, Dr. Anulavijay Sundara.
I would I like to ask uh, Panduka whether you have encountered acute fibrinogen liver cell failure and thrombocytopenia in your patients with leptospirosis. Because during the time I worked in Ragama with, with the Mithurajavela work, there are a lot of people who got leptospirosis. And liver cell failure was a, was a, you know, was a dreaded complication we encountered. And thrombocytopenia was, was very frequently, uh, but of course not, they didn't get primary hemorrhages, yeah. but it was really you know, very f f f uh, common to find below 100,000, below 50,000. But they didn't get frank hemorrhages like now, the primary hemorrhages. Yep. Well, um, uh, thrombocytopenia, certainly, yes, we do see that uh, even in the not so sick patients. Um, uh, liver failure, uh, interestingly, not so much. Uh, certainly not, not as much as kidney failure. Um, I don't know exactly why. Sometimes people think that uh, the, the, uh, the lesion in leptospirosis is more subcellular rather than the whole liver cell itself. Uh, so, but for some reason, uh, acute liver cell failure, if it does happen, we would be more concerned about things like a cirrhotic patient coming with that condition or someone with uh, alcoholic uh, hepatitis or al alcohol withdrawal and so on. Uh, but low platelet counts, of course, that I agree. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Histologically, they have centrilobular liver cell necrosis with uh, leptospirosis. Can I ask Dr. Disanaga a question? There is increasing recognition of the role of uh, cellular immunity in COVID. And I think uh, the vaccines also tend to depend partly on that. What is the position of BCG vaccination in preventing COVID? Is there any? There have been actually some uh, very good uh, postulates saying that uh, the BCG has a protective effect uh, on uh, patients who are, you know, for, from developing uh, COVID. But uh, when you look at the data, as usual, you know, it is not very convincing to say that there is a protective effect. But I think we have very good uh, two cohorts now, sir. We have cohorts in India, which are, we, they are usually being given BCG vaccination. And we have a cohort of patients in the United States. You, they are not usually given BCG vaccination. Now, if you look at the values, uh, U USA at the moment has a higher mortality than when you compare to the Indian population. But there might be certain, a lot of confounders on this. So I think that will be, that, that will be a very good uh, opportunity for us if we analyze these studies, because the, the, both countries have a very large amount of people who are suffering from uh, COVID as well as a lot of mortality there. But even though BCG is said, is said to be protective uh, because of the previous observations that it was mostly in the temperate countries that uh, COVID was spreading like wildfire. But it has been proven wrong with Brazil and uh, India coming into the picture. So probably I think that they will analyze this data and probably we might be able to come out with the answer. Uh, what about BCG vaccination in the United States? Is it uh, commonly practiced? I'm not sure, sir. I think it is not commonly given. It is not, I no. 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 It is usually given in certain P individuals, it is but. given for children of Asian origin. Origin, yes. Yeah. But other than okay. that, the mass populations, they have not given. Right. This, uh, may I, sorry, yes? No, the, uh, this is from uh, Panduka. Uh, now, I actually happened to s notice that uh, there was an advertisement from the MOH Ampar with regard to uh, uh, distributing doxycycline among farmers as prophylaxis for leptospirosis. So, is it a sort of a decision that has been made to be, I mean, to distribute all these things uh, uh, throughout the island, or it was, is it sort of a uh, uh, isolated? a few cases uh, and that he sort of only, only confined to the region uh, that they are distributing? Uh, I, I think it is an official decision. Basically, the MOHs uh, in uh, leptospirosis, high areas, they do distribute that to farmers as an official step. Uh, in some areas, it seems to be working because uh, some of my colleagues say that in some areas, the patients they get are the ones who didn't take prophylaxis. In other areas, it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, people who have taken doxyprophylaxis also come with leptospirosis. Maybe there is something to do with antibiotic sensitivity also, we can't be sure. But anyway, um, it is important that we uh, address the question of whether doxyprophylaxis actually works. It might not be working as much as we hope it does. Um, again, it's something for the public health specialists to look into in great detail. This doxyprophylaxis was uh, recommended because of some 
limited number of studies and the Cochrane collaboration study uh, uh, review showed that it is not effective if we, if we pool the data together. Uh, the original studies which were effective was from Vietnam and so on where they gave once a week because that was in, uh, for example, there was one study where the American soldiers were given once a week because they go to the field once a week. Uh, they go on Monday and fight and come back. Um, so then they were given doxy and they, they were given doxy because it covers so many other infections also. So uh, including leptospirosis. So I mean we have to look at our own context and make a decision I think. Uh, one the important thing would be to see the antibiotic sensitivity of our own strains uh, to make that decision. If I can add, in Raghaman, the PHIs visit the paddy field areas and is given to the farmers prophylactically because it was a major problem in Raghaman those days. So PHIs carry out the work of, uh, you know, and the instruction of the MOH. And the dose is 500, uh, 100 once milligrams week. weekly, once isn't it? Once a week. So it's easy to take also. Yes, it is, yes. Can I ask Dr. Undugod again? I heard this year they have only one vaccine for Northern and Southern Hemisphere. See, is it true? Uh, I'm not sure, sir. Well, Generally, they do make one for Southern yes. and also Northern. But this and year it could be one. But please clarify that. I think. Yes, because what, what is made for Northern is what we get. And actually, we have gotten the flu vaccine now, and it is available uh, for the patients to take. So and and, and do, do we recommend that? Um, so here, the actually, we uh, recommend it for most of our chronic respiratory disease uh, patients, bronchiectasis, COPD, elderly. So those patients, we do routinely vaccinate them uh, once a year, madam. Pregnancy, I'm, I'm not sure. Pregnancy I don't think so. Immunocompromised? Yes, right. Yes, immunocompromised, chronic respiratory diseases for pregnancy, disease, I don't think they are. The are recommendation is, madam, now pregnancy also, that we are actually getting a subunit vaccine as well now, and it's not a live attenuated one. Yes. So, uh, in pregnancy, it has shown that the mortality due to influenza is increased with the increasing amount of uh, poor fetal outcomes. So, actually, there is a tendency to give the influenza vaccine throughout the world. And uh, I think we actually had a discussion with Dr. Kapila was also there yes. uh, about recommending influenza vaccine to our pregnant ladies yes. when we can think about the complications. And in principle, they agreed actually. Because there was a seminar on influenza at the SLMA and yes. there yes. they recommended this. Oh, so now they are yes. routinely given? No, of course. No, I don't no. Know. Maybe it is a problem. We were trying to, Shantimani, put it to the uh, National Immunization Program. But uh, there were problems about the feasibility, and about the, the cost, cost and, and everything. Uh, cost and uh, but actually, uh, at the meeting that I was there, uh, there was an agreement to do it as a pilot and see for about two or three years to give the influenza vaccine. I don't know how it progressed. Yeah, it was the meeting was about six months back. So by maternal mortality, the leading cause was uh, at one la about two years ago, yes. dengue. Then it was respiratory disease. One year it was respiratory disease during the time of this epidemic. Mm -hmm. So that's why it, go it was discussed. But if uh, pregnancy is an indication to use antivirals, I suppose the vaccine should be indicated in pregnant women. If you consider them as a special risk group to get influenza. Isn't that so? Any other questions, please? We have got a few minutes more. What's that? No chat. I would like to ask Sandeepan, where did you get those pictures? It was from the internet? All the old pictures, it was very nice to how similar one century ago and now, no? It was really interesting. They have gone through the exact same thing that we yes. are going through now. And uh, it's quite uh, very interesting. Lots of interesting stories in and, and cartoons and all that. Yes, in black and white, yes. In fact, that road cleaner was uh, old one, 100 years ago, not local, uh, not uh, present day. No, no, he's an old one, but the next chap was covered in top to bottom in quality. Yes. Was, uh, yeah. 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 There was some confusion about COVID, COVID infection and leptospirosis. When a patient died, uh, was... In the Navy. There Navy. was a Navy officer yes. who died with leptospirosis. What was... But that was concerned with leptospirosis. Oh. Yes, yes. Because the media covered it and said it was a naval officer who has been in hospital in an intensive care, but this was not uh, COVID. But he was cremated the same way yes. as leptos as the COVID. But it was uh, a naval officer with leptos. Actually, madam, we also had a such a patient uh, who was transferred from Haliago, a young boy, 22 year old, coming with acute distress, acute respiratory distress. 
so the, there he had multiple pulmonary opacities as well so anyway the differential diagnosis that we had to consider was covid yeah. so we had to separate an icu for him yeah. until earlier the covid test they took about three or four days sometimes yeah. so yeah. we had to we had to isolate him and then but we treated him as leptospirosis yeah. but at the mean in the meantime there was high suspicion of covid there were about two patients coming with uh, pulmonary opacities yeah. uh, renal impairment uh, clinically uh, exactly looking like uh, leptospirosis but we had to exclude COVID in uh, infection in that. The, uh, the young man, one patient survived, one died. Actually one thing that I didn't address sir, is uh, co-infection. Uh, leptospirosis does uh, co coexist with dengue and hunter virus. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, and there are some distinguishing those difficult, no? Yeah, very difficult to differentiate the two of them. You need the antibody test to do that, that's right. Uh, and regarding ECMO, then it's a very costly very thing. Costly. I think, as far as I know, only yeah. Karapati has a working ECMO. That's right. And but in Lady Rizzi Hospital, it's, all, it's so not it's working. Not yeah. So, oh. because I know that they had a present. The virus is like, equipment is there, but, but nobody's doing it. In Karapitiya, they, they, there was a, a little girl, about 10 year old girl who was uh, in, in, in mm -hmm. uh, chlorine from the Swedasan Stadium pool. Mm -hmm. And actually, she was almost dying when they transferred her to ECMO and that take, to Karapitiya, mm -hmm. and that saved her. And that was given at a, at a monthly meeting with the Karapitiya Teaching Society, Clinical Society. So, ECMO was life saving in that, young, in that little girl from now, chlorine poisoning. In COVID, with this membrane developing, preventing oxygen diffusion, what is the place of uh, the no usual type of ventilation? Uh, ECMO is there, def yes, but what about the normal uh, ventilation? That it be, is it of any use? The mechanical ventilation? Yes. Yes, sir, because they, are, they describe two phenotypes, you know, L type and H type with the COVID 19. So you have this one type where they, it is very easy to, um, the lungs are very compliant and it's very easy to ventilate. And then they can progress to H type where the lungs are very heavy and full of edema and difficult. So the ventilatory strategies differ, differ between the two. I of course have no personal experience in managing COVID-19 patients, but I have listened to a couple of webinars. So what they're saying is you have to give ventilate them for long periods because you have to give support them for quite some time for them to uh, recover. So there is a definite uh, place. Uh, but ECMO certainly would be more yes, effective yes. if yes, available. Yes, because there were like a couple of, I was talking to a couple mm. of colleagues in the UK, so they have actually used ECMO in their patients and the patients have uh, recovered. There was this British uh, pilot no, who yes. was uh, treated in Hong Kong hospital. He was on ventilator for two months ah. and they were trying yes. to uh, do a lung transplant when he finally responded after two months of uh, c continuous ventilation. ventilation. But they managed without ECMO. They have managed without yeah. ECMO. And they were planning a lung transfer when he recovered. And he was so grateful and he said he might have died in England, but because it happened in Hong Kong, he recovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he has said that, you know, I'm alive because it happened outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably he was the only patient in the intensive care at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he said so much of muscular wasting, it will take months and months for him to be up and about. That's what they say. And what about, are there any long-term consequences of influenza pneumonia, which they suspect in COVID? Post-influenza. Uh, uh, post post yes, so that's why I was talking about there is an increased uh, prevalence of okay. numblets and various things. And most of these neurological complications, I'm sure Madam would be able to say, yes. post-encephalitis and things like that, especially influenza A in little children, they can have a lot of neurological problem, which leads to long-term uh, sequelae. Yes. Because this... Uh, pandemic a century ago gave rise to paralysis agitans, isn't it? Yes. We used to see patients early on in our career, there Parkinson's. There are many, many forms of neurological complications that may happen with direct infections as well as mediated by immune mechanisms. No? And immune mechanisms at varying stages, maybe two years, maybe two, two weeks, two years. Uh, so uh, they would come up as even encephalopathy or other peripheral Gillen-Barre type of uh, encephalomyelitis in any of the forms.